Approaching the pine forest on the edge of Izium, the sharp, fresh smell of trees in the air, and you start, without thinking, to feel relaxed. There's the blue sky above and the warm autumn sun, the winding paths. This was a pleasant place once. But it's clear as you approach the forest that something's wrong there. The sandy ground beneath the pines, needle-strewn and dappled with sunlight, is heaped into huge mounds. Deep tyre marks have made a mess of the path. You step gingerly over the ruts. And a little further along the edge of the forest, a tank, Ukrainian, lurks under camouflage. This was a Russian position when they held Izum, their regional stronghold, for six months. Between the hills of earth are hollows to hide vehicles in. Now they're filled with rubbish, crushed tins of Baltica beer, water bottles, wet wipes. The trash the Russians left behind when they fled in September. They'd used the pine forest here as a camp, but also as a mass grave. Across the path, a few hundred yards in, police tape stretches from tree to tree. It's everywhere, wrapped around spindly trunks, spooled on the ground, the red lettering already fading in the sun. Here in September, after Izum's liberation, forensic experts and emergency workers donned biohazard suits and exhumed more than 440 bodies. Some had their hands bound behind their backs. Some showed signs of torture. And many had died from wounds sustained during the shelling of Izum, including children. On one of the markers, a photograph of the old woman has been pinned, Grave 299. In the picture, she's holding her own family photographs. Her now empty coffin still lies in the shallow hole, strewn with plastic bags. Other markers are just planks of wood with scant details scrawled in marker pen. Number 284 bears an address, Prospect Lenina 35, and the Russian word Dedoshka, old man, grandad. Many of those who ended up in this makeshift grave were elderly. I find dates of birth going back to the 1930s. Those too infirm or too scared to leave their home. It's the same story all across Ukraine. But then there are three crosses clustered together. Leaning at drunken angles in the now empty hollows. Elena and Dmitri, a couple in their early 30s. And next to them, Olesya, six years old. Her middle name is Dmitrievna, the patronymic indicating her father was called Dmitri, and she shares the couple's last name, so it looks like a whole little family, hastily buried together, all killed on the 9th of March. There was apparently heavy shelling that day when Russians broke the ceasefire that should have let buses evacuate people to safety. And now we're here, after the fact, piecing things together from what remains. I walk through the forest very slowly with a writer called Maxime. He's looking for what could be the grave of his friend, the children's author, Vladimir Vakulenka. The name was on the burial lists, but Maxime tells me the body exhumed from that grave was that of an unknown woman. And it gave Vladimir's friends and family some hope. Perhaps he's in a Russian prison or being held in occupied Donbass. It's a bitter kind of hope, though, knowing the conditions he'd be held in, the strong likelihood that he could have been tortured. The methods Russian troops favour include electrocution using old Soviet field telephones, waterboarding, vicious beatings. The stories that came from Izum after liberation were just as horrifying as those from Bucha, just as nauseating. It's the same story every time. It is a tactic. It's what Ukrainians sarcastically refer to as Ruski Mir, this Russian world to which President Putin thinks they rightfully belong. It's not the only old phrase that's become deeply, unfunnily ironic. Maxime bends down to study some of the old Russian trash that litters the site. There's green camo packets of rations, chocolate spreads, boiled vegetables, stewed pork out of date. And the logo on it all is a Russian company called Druzhba Narodov, Friendship of the Peoples. It was a Stalinist construct, a lie of brotherly love and equality between the Soviet Union's disparate and often repressed nationalities. 
It still carries weight in Russia. While living there, I was told many times of the peaceful coexistence of ethnic groups across present-day Russia as well as the USSR. People still believe the big lie. Maxim turns one tin over with his toe, looking revolted. Here in Ukraine, the friendship of the people's phrase had long sounded old-fashioned. Now it sounds sick 